This is one of the last 50 or so pumping engines left in England and it has an unexpected history. Way back in the early part of the 1800s, the black country experienced a series of deadly cholera outbreaks which killed thousands of people. The cause was down to poor living and working conditions. Bilston had three deadly outbreaks. Poor drinking water was the problem here. Flooded mines and industrial pollution meant that Bilston had to buy its water from Wolverhampton. Rather than rely on Wolverhampton, the Bilston Urban Council decided to get its own independent supply. Wombourne was chosen for a new well. The water would be pumped to a reservoir on Goldthorn Hill. Pipes and reservoir were all outside the old Wolverhampton boundaries. Nearly four miles of pipe and a lift of 345 feet from the Bratch. Gravity would then feed water from Goldthorn down to Bilston. At the Bratch, we had two 150 foot wells. They're brick lined and tarred, and they were linked to angled boreholes going down another 600 feet deep into the sandstone beds. That's a total of more than 1,100 feet. We had two pumping engines, each could pump one million gallons of water in a 20 hour day. One engine normally worked at a time. The engines were built by Thornwill and Warham of Burton and Trent. They worked from 1896 until 1960. The building cost £6,133 and it was completed in 1895. Rob and red brick is combined with blue brick to create this superb confection of a building. The designer was Baldwin Latham of Westminster and they excelled themselves with the detailing. Four turrets combined with some outstanding designs over windows and doorways. The building looks just like the castle so popular on canal paintings. This production tries to give you a feel for this powerful steam engine, even to show you how a steam engine works. It also shows how the engine you see also powered the first stage well pumps, which drew water from the deep well before forcing it at high pressure all the way up to Goldthorn Hill. Len Crane is our chief engineer. He drove the whole restoration forward. He takes up the story. Behind that wall there was a sediment tank after the lift pumps had lifted the water, flooded it into that tank behind the wall there. And then that, the sediment was obviously the sand, the, the sand uh, obviously went down to the water and, and, and settled on the bottom. And we used to have a di uh, diver come and actually clear all the sediment out periodically. And then of course the water from there was drawn through with these pumps. Uh, that's the actual lift pump itself uh, from there. The lift, that's the, the, the actual valve what lifts the water on that side, goes through into the ram. The ram works up and down and pumps the water through then into the pressure valve. And that's the non-return valve that side. And from that non-return valve then the three, the three pumps go through into one manifold, which is the other side of this wall. And that goes through into the, into the air tank, which is outside. And the air tanks are full of, com of, uh, of air, compressed air. And by doing that, they, they, these were pumped into there in three different throbs of water, as you might say. And then through the, the actual air in the tank, it formed a damper. And instead of three throbs coming out the other side to go up to sort of Bell Thornhill, where the, the reservoir was, um, you got one squirt. And by doing that, of course, it didn't uh, didn't uh, wreck the pipework going all the way from here to Galthorn Hill, um, which would have pulled the joints. If there had been three throbs working, it would have pulled the joints. Well, this is the ma this is the actual delivery manifold of Alexandra. Uh, we've got the one at that end there, which is from Victoria. That's the manifold going from the pressure side of the pumps, delivery pumps. This is the one of Alexandra's delivery pumps. And of course they go out to I say to the air vessels outside. Well, this is the pressure vessel, which is on is outside the building actually, and this receives the delivery from the pumps. As I showed you inside was the manifold, the delivery manifold, comes into a point there, 
and it's pumped into this vessel. Now originally there would have been a water gauge on here, which is gone I'm afraid, and uh, that would keep an air, halfway up would be air in there, air pressure, and below of course is the water. And it's pumped into there from the engine, from Victoria on this, on this one. The air then it takes the, as I say, the pulses, the pulsations out of the three pumps and makes it into one flow which goes out of the pipe below here now and goes through and out the main gates and straight up to Gullthorne Hill, four and a half miles away. Ah, now, on this side, of course, uh, this has all been um, cleared away or cut up years ago before we came. I'm afraid I can't describe it to you. But on the two flywheels, there's crank pins on the flywheels. The originally, on this footway here, there was a bridge going over. So the fitters in the day, or the, the, um, the people who worked on the engine actually, would have to go over the bridge because two connecting rods came through here. Uh, two wooden connecting rods, fish bellied in the middle for strength, with the bearings on each end, a bearing on that end, and a bearing on this end. And they both worked as the fly was going around this way, as, as, uh, as far as I can remember it anyway, going like this. And on the edge of this hole here was the two bearings. And the bearings, as the rockets went like that, had the droppers, and the droppers went down, down the well, which is here, of course. But it's been blanked off, uh, obviously, for, 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 um, for safety. When they first shut the engines down in 1960, uh, they dropped the first electric pumps down in the well here, which uh, went for a few years. But of course, uh, they built a new station outside, they put the electric pumps outside, and sunk a new well, which is working now. But this one is still here, an eight foot diameter hole goes straight down, uh, 150 foot into a, um, uh, a room, quite a big room, all brick built, and that's where the pumps were for the suction. And I can just remember these two big beams coming through here and working like that, and the two droppers going down the well. Well, this was the original uh, borehole that they built in 1890. I sunk the first borehole here. Uh, there's an eight foot hole which goes down where the pumps lifted from under this concrete. We, uh, this is the capping off area. Um, the two uh, holes or tunnels or whatever you want to call them here had the two big condensers in. The two condensers in there. The water was lifted from here through, went through the condenser and cooled the, the, the exhaust steam off back to water again, which went through to the hot well. And then the, um, the water then flowed next door, through the wall there, into, into the sediment tank. All we've got left here now is an inspection cover, which uh, Seven Trent now and again still come lift up and send a diver down just to see what the conditions are, I think. This wall here is where the two bearings were on, where the two rocking beams came and the two rockets were there and they operated across here and then dropped down the well. This is uh, the one uh, pump ram uh, which we had to get out of Victoria. Uh, in 1963, a very bad, bad frost and there obviously the pumps were left full of water. So the inevitable happened and no antifreeze of course were in them. So we've got this problem of the, of the frost cracking the actual ram. And as you can see, yeah, that's the actual piece of the, you can see how thick it is, it's, it's getting up seven eighths of an inch thick and it's split that from end to end, it's also split the actual ram from end to end and uh, we had to jack, jack that out to get it out and we got two 25 ton jacks, one on each side and it took us three days to get that out. We took one off Alexandra and put into Victoria to get the, the one engine running. This is where it all starts from. We, we've got the steam coming down the main steam pipe to the valve upstairs. This uh, is my connection between the valve upstairs and down here, and this is the control valve. And if I open this up, obviously it's screwing the screw upstairs now, which is opening the valve up there and letting the steam through. And uh, uh, I have to just listen 
mainly. There's no mechanical sense at all. I have to just listen for the steam to come through the main steam pipe. And I know then when it's going to hit the, this piston for the first time. And of course, this is the high pressure piston. It comes in here at 150 pounds per square inch and pushes this piston down. And once that started working, operating, the exhaust steam from that one, of course, goes into the second piston, works that one up and down, and then goes into the third one, which is a low pressure piston, and works that one up and down. We start off, the first high pressure piston is 16 inches diameter, three foot stroke. Then it exhausts into the second one, which is 28 inches bore by three foot stroke. And that then exhausts into the low pressure one, uh, which is uh, 42 inches, 3 foot 6, 42 inches by 3 foot stroke. And the calculations all work out, of course, that we get the same power at each big end. Uh, so you get the same thrust at each big end. And uh, then, of course, it all goes to the, out, to the, out to the air at the moment, the exhaust goes through the wall, out into the air outside. But, of course, it should have a condenser. And um, uh, there's no condensers they'd gone when I came in here. Uh, we're trying to find a good condenser at the moment, but we haven't got one, I'm afraid. So the engine is running very, very light. It's not pumping water at the moment. And also, we've got no vacuum. By not having the condenser, I've got no vacuum. So the engine's not exactly running properly, but at least it runs. And, uh, well, it gives a very good performance, actually. Uh, of course, we've got the three, three gauges here. Well, four gauges, actually. Mm -hmm. The three gauges are the pressure side of the engine. Uh, the first one... It comes in at 150 pounds, uh, and then of course the second gauge gives you the, the, the second cylinder as pressure, uh, probably uh, dropping down in our case, it drops down to about 50 pounds from 150 in the second cylinder. Then the third gauge is for the low pressure cylinder, and that drops down to about 25 pounds at the moment. But, but of course it would be a lot more than that if the engine was working in pumping water. So the fourth gauge is not working at the moment because that's the vacuum gauge and no condenser so no vacuum. So eventually I hope to have all that working. This is triple expansion engine. This is the actual cylinders part of the engine. Uh, this is the high pressure one, which is, as I said before, is 16 inches diameter. Uh, then we go into the, the second cylinder, which is uh, 28 inches diameter. And the big one at the end is the low pressure cylinder, uh, which is 3 foot 6, that's 45, uh, 42 inches diameter. This is the steam chest on the high pressure one. This is the one where it comes in at 150 pounds. Uh, when that's worked up and down with the, with the, the piston on the top and bottom, of course it exhausts like I said before. And it comes through this exhaust pipe here, which is this, this exhaust pipe. And this is shaped like a vessel, like that, because the the engine themselves, they expand. When they get to the full working pressure, they expand. And the, this exhaust here has to expand as well. Of course, it's like a, a dish. It works like that as, as, the, as the expansion takes place. Then it goes into the second cylinder, which is the steam chest there. Uh, exactly the same as this one, only a lot bigger to take the, take the steam. As it condenses, it needs more area to, to go into. And then, of course, it goes from this one into the third cylinder to the same exhaust system you can see the pipe there and that's what you see how much bigger that one is than this one again because the steam is condensing so it needs a bigger area to go into this is the regulator handle which comes up this is the secondary one uh, which is on the top floor just in case you want to move it up here uh, it comes up of course through here into the screw thread and this operates the actual valve that's the actual steam valve itself the steam is at 150 pounds at that point and until I screw this, of course, nothing will happen to the engine at all until it lifts the valve and lets the steam through. Well, this, this is the coreless trip gear, of course, and a uh, little bit difficult to explain exactly, but the valve is a rotary valve, semi-rotary valve, it doesn't go all the way around, only semi-rotary. And the idea is that the valve rotates so far, lets the steam into the piston, and then is shut. Uh, and the steam carries on and expands and works the piston the rest of the way. That's why it's called a triple expansion engine. The eccentric arm is valve very slowly. And when it gets to a certain point, there's a cam on this trip gear which trips the trip and the valve shuts immediately. A big spring shuts the, the, the valve immediately and shuts the steam off. And then the expansion carries on. The, this rod here 
is part of the is part of the spring gear. Now this chamber here has got a big square spring in there. Well, it's made out of one-inch square steel. It's a very strong spring in there. And when the eccentric is opening the valve, it pulls the piston along and compresses the spring uh, that way. And when the trip occurs by the cam, trips the trips the trip. This big spring immediately closes this this piston straight off like that. And by pulling, it pulls the valve back immediately, shuts the valve immediately. But of course, if we let the piston go slam back with this big spring, uh, there'll be some damage occurring. So there's a valve on the back here, which, uh, as the piston goes forward, draws air into the back. And of course, the back of the piston is full of air. And when the spring is, re is released, the piston goes back very quickly, but at the bottom end, the air is only let out through a, through a release valve very, very slowly. So the air is actually a big damper. And instead of the piston, it's in the back, and that's all controlled by a valve. Well, this, this part here is for, it's actually for timing the engine, for setting the timing of the valves, the inlet and exhaust. Um, there's left and right hand threads here, uh, and by screwing that one way or the other, it, 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 it lengthens or shortens that rod. And by doing that, I can advance and retard the movement on the valve in, in there itself, the actual movement of the valve. And there's one for the top valve and one for the bottom inlet valve. And I can set those by an indicator. I can set those till they're both equal. So the opening on both of those is exactly the same. And then this screw system here is that I can turn that and it moves both valves together. So you can advance and retard the timing of the actual valves on, on, the, on the engine by doing that. And then, of course, it's locked off with a nut when you satisfy this in the right place. This valve here is off the main manifold, 